The Senate Business and Labor Relations Committee voted six to four on a collective bargaining substitute measure for school teachers. It turned down an original bill sponsored by Representative Jerry Powell, which would have provided for binding arbitration of unresolved disputes. The measure adopted was similar to a 1975 meet and confer bill, which failed in the legislature, but requires meetings between teachers and employer to iron out differences. The Alabama Education Association favors the establishment of a decision-making policy bill. Its executive secretary, Paul Hubbard, said 32 other states have collective bargaining legislation and schools have not gone to pot because of it. State School Superintendent of Education, Wayne Teague, agrees that educators need to be heard but not under strict bargaining controls. George, we feel that all educators certainly have an input to the, to the part of the education that affects them. However, this bill the AEA is, is pushing today is a hardcore collective bargaining bill the NEA is urging. And I think most people realize the AEA is a farm team of NEA. And, and in my opinion and many other people, that NEA has, is determined to get control of public education through the collective bargaining process. It's my position that uh, education does not belong to educators, but to the public. Another effort was made today in the House Ways and Means Committee to provide tenure for school support personnel. The measure was defeated on a 7-5 to five vote. It failed in committee on two previous occasions on tie votes. Those who are against the bill contend the measure would diminish the authority of local boards of education. In the State Administration Committee, there was an effort to report out a bill to do away with the Sunset Committee. However, that failed because the sponsor of that legislation was not present. The full legislature meets tomorrow. The House comes in at 10. The Senate will be here at 11 o'clock. From the State Capitol, George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. Well, the cattle uh, winter has been uh, tough this year on the cattle business in Alabama. It's not been quite as bad as last winter, of course, but the thing that has been so bad, Dave, is the fact that we suffered that severe drought in 1977. Of course, as you know, the cattle industry has had four bad years of depressed prices and cost of production being less, uh, more than what we got for our cattle. So it's roughly four, for four years, the cattlemen have really been in a tight uh, squeeze as far as low prices and bad weathers. But we really feel very good today about it. The cattle prices are up, and we have liquidated a large number of cattle in this state and that means that our numbers are down and therefore prices should go up. Now last year and maybe several other years in Alabama we've had to import like expensive hay and that sort of thing from the Midwest. Did we see that again this year? Well not very much of that this year because finally I think we had a very mild winter uh, up through till we got into December, January and really uh, we I think we're gonna get by. We planned a lot of winter grazing but uh, it's been tough but we are gonna make it and now we're on the road upward again, and we are delighted. As of last night, I, I knew not whether I was going to Alabama or Arkansas. And any time uh, anyone come to me in, with a given situation that I don't understand or they don't understand, I tell them to get on their knees and pray. So that I took my own advice last night, and I did a lot of praying. And this morning, I woke up wanting to go to Arkansas. Coach Lou Holtz, I understand, flew in today and signed you. Yes, sir. I, I was really excited about that because uh, I was really impressed with Coach Holtz. He's he's so enthusiastic. It makes you makes you feel good when you you got a coach that thinks on your level. What did he tell you? Well, he told me that they were really interested in me, and if I weren't starting by my sophomore year, something was wrong. So you that's one of the reasons huh, that you felt like you could play quicker at Arkansas than perhaps Alabama. Yes, that's that's one of the reasons because Arkansas hadn't signed but two backs in the last two years. Therefore. I, I felt I could get a chance to play and play early. I understand their system is the same as what you're accustomed to at Jeff Davis. Well, actually, it's the exact same system. Um, a couple of years ago, our whole coaching staff went down to visit Coach O.C. When he that's was at where, NC State? Right, and that's where we got our terminology from. So you mean the, you know the plays and everything before you go, huh? Right, and that's a big plus.
WCOV radio will be out of uh, service temporarily because of a fire that struck our transmitter building this afternoon. We do not know the extent of the damage at this time, but we will be working to restore service as quickly as possible. Harold Ingram is described by his superiors as brilliant. He's been given excellent job performance ratings for more than 25 years. For those 25 years, Ingram was chief of communications. After he went to court, he was transferred. Ingram says he's being punished by his boss, C.V. Moody State Forrester. Ingram says he's an advisor, but that no one has asked him for advice for long periods of time. So I go for weeks at the time, and uh, I don't uh, receive any requests at all of any nature whatsoever. Are these requests in writing or by phone? Always in writing. When were you asked for advice last? Of a purely technical nature, I haven't been asked for any advice in several months. No, I mean, this, this is more just, uh, you know, you get bored or tired of sitting in one position and you have to move from one to the other. You know, eight hours is a long time to do nothing. And uh, it, it's just a matter of... Uh, moving from one position to the other. Ingram's boss, State Forester C.B. Moody, says that he's not harassing Ingram and said he would have more to say when all the court suits are settled. Moody, uh, Mr. Ingram says that uh, he was reassigned from his job as Chief Communications Officer for the Forestry Commission because he went to court to retain his peace officer status. What would you say to that? I can emphatically say that I know what uh, I go through in my thinking processes and there is no connection. Mr. Ingram says that uh, he received a, a letter from you or from one of his superiors saying that he was not to go out of the building and that he could only go to the toilet. <laughs> I don't know where that letter is or who originated it. At this point, it looks like the Ingram story will not come to an end until the courts make a decision on who is right. Until that time, Ingram will probably continue to read books and find the most comfortable position on his desk for his feet. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. The only way the six families on Harper Street can take a hot bath is in a tin tub with water heated on a stove carried by bucket from an outdoor faucet. The people here have been waiting for city sewage for years. They say they've complained to councilmen and others, but they still have to use outdoor toilets and water buckets still provide precious water here. 83-year-old Freddie Gomer has to borrow water from his neighbor across the street and says he wants indoor plumbing, but doesn't feel the city can be rushed. I know I got to put in if they ever get him with it. And I can't say nothing until they do get him with it. I can't push him. What do you do for a toilet? Well, I use outside toilet right now. Would you like to have an inside toilet? Well, I can't do nothing. 
I'd like to have it, but I can't push the folks. All I was using outside toilets now. What would you say if they finally came one day and fixed it so you could have an inside toilet? Well, I'd just have to be ready for it. <laughs> Are you ready for it? I think so. If I can, I can make a rough step. Homes a few hundred yards away from Hopper Street have indoor plumbing. But Hopper Street presents a problem to city engineers. They say a special pumping station must be installed because the street is in such a low-lying area. They say plans are already drawn up for this street. But Mrs. Hycation Billups, a resident of Hopper Street since 1961, says she and other residents have received promise after promise, but no action from city officials. It don't seem like it's, uh, I'm going to ever get it, but uh, I have had so many promises by the city sufficient, but they never have made a ten. The world really have turned around since I was five years old with everybody except me. I'm still in the same attitude now that I was when I was five years old. So far as using pots and paints, wash paints and foot tubs and so forth. And I think it's terrible. I'm mostly four blocks from the Capitol. And we don't have no kind of convenial your tenants is down here, and I think it's terrible. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think you will ever get indoor plumbing here on Hopper Street? Well, from the way it's going, no. I don't think I ever get any from the way it's going. It's always a promise, and nobody never show up to do anything. Hopper Street is included in the city engineer's plan for indoor plumbing installation. But just when the engineer will get here and solve the problem of Mrs. Billups and her neighbors is unknown. We were told that they would be here last January or the middle of February, but so far they have not been here, and so Mrs. Billups and her neighbors will probably be inconvenienced a little longer. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, Hopper Street. It's what Ted Bundy has been doing the past six weeks that concerns Florida officers and lawmen all over the southeast. Bundy, when he appeared before a Pensacola judge yesterday afternoon, at first refused to admit his identity and was refused bond. He said he was a Tallahassee man and carried 21 credit cards stolen in the Tallahassee area. Bundy's now charged with theft and assaulting a police officer. I was patrolling west side of town and uh, it was noted that it was a suspicious, suspicious vehicle behind a building. And uh, as a matter of routine, I was running a check on the tag when it did come back as a stolen vehicle. Uh, this time, uh, the traffic stop was made, and the subject did resist arrest. Were there shots? Well, initially, when I was putting, placing the handcuffs on him, he kicked my feet out from under me and struck me with uh, a handcuff that had been placed on one wrist. And, of course, knocked me off my feet, and uh, that's when it started. It ended, obviously, with Bundy behind bars in the second-floor jail at Pensacola Police Headquarters. At a press conference there this morning, State's Attorney Curtis Golden said he intends to keep Bundy in Florida until all the questions have been answered about Bundy's six weeks of freedom. Bundy apparently was in Tallahassee January 15th, the day two Florida State University co-eds were strangled and their three roommates beaten. From the early part of January, possibly the first week in January, until immediately before he came to Pensacola. He said he came to Pensacola. Golden said none of the credit cards had been stolen from the sorority house where the murder occurred, but all had been taken from fraternities and sororities. Bundy lived in a room less than a mile from the Chi Omega murder scene. The sheriff there considers Bundy a very serious suspect because the slings are similar to those that have caused West Coast lawmen to try to link Bundy to 36 sex slings. Left unsaid is also the fact that Florida doesn't want to be responsible for another Bundy escape. He's kept under strict security. The police building is closed to all visitors because threats have been received against Bundy.
You have such a, a widespread popularity. Mm -hmm. You have managed to bridge the, the age gap, the sex gap, the musical taste gap. You've had hits in country music, you've had hits in popular music, rock and roll music. How do you account for this? Um, well, I like to sing a lot of uh, different types of songs. I think that's what it starts, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, my audience is a wide audience, from little children, you know, to old people. So it's, it becomes um, difficult sometimes to know what to record, you know, because uh, I like country music a lot. I like ballads. I like rock and roll. I like rhythm and blues. So I do all these things. Has Tom Jones had to change his style since the mid-60s when uh, 65 saw it's not unusual to, to today? Have you changed your style? Not really. Um, I do basically the same things. I just, in the act, in my stage act, I try to keep up with the times by doing songs, you know, that are current. And um, I watch people dance in discotheques and try to put in, you know, new moves. So, I mean, if you saw a film, film of me in the 60s, you know, TV thing, then you would see a difference from then to now because of the, uh, you know, the music slightly changed and dance movements have certainly changed. Do you think of yourself as a sex symbol? Uh, well, I think of myself as an entertainer, but um, when I'm on stage, you know, when a lot of women come up to the stage and uh, you can't but be aware of, of the fact you know that that's the way the audience sees me and that's fine by me when did it start with uh, room keys being thrown on the stage and <coughs> ladies lingerie appearing on stage when did all this begin it started in uh, 1968 in uh, New York and Las Vegas uh, I think maybe New York I was in the Copacabana uh, first of all in 1968 and um, I perspire so much that women were coming up with um, table napkins, you know, for me to wipe my face. And then some woman came up with uh, underwear, you know, wanting to be different, I suppose. And uh, Earl Wilson put it in his column. And it, you know, people started doing it. Are these yours, love? You won't? Pardon? All right, come here then. Take your time, take your time. Okay, these are yours, are they? But watch you don't catch cold now. Oh, these are yours? These are yours? Uh, we'll reinforce them down here. A lot of people have compared you <coughs> with uh, the late Elvis Presley. How would you compare yourself to Presley? Well, um, <coughs> excuse me. We are both uh, single entertainers. Um, a lot of movement, you know, in, in the act. And uh, I mean, I was influenced by Elvis Presley when I first saw him. I think he had a great influence on my career. And we, st um, he sang a lot of the type of thing that, that I sing um, and I found it because uh, I knew him quite well and when we would talk our musical um, backgrounds were familiar and uh, we liked the same type of music.
which I think is fortunate <laughs> because I think you have an excellent news program. I've been very pleased. The sports coverage has been very good in comparison to what I had in Mobile. Anything? For all of these different types of loans, there's, we have approximately 3,000 students this academic year that are receiving some aid under these programs. The amounts of the loans, of course, vary, but I would say approximately 3,000 students this year. Well, I do know that there are a lot of institutions which uh, have approximately the same size enrollment as we do here at Auburn that have a heavier commitment into loan programs that we, than we do at Auburn. But for those students that apply and demonstrate a need and meet the eligibility requirements for the loan programs, we do have sufficient monies to help all of those students that apply and qualify. Uh, what kind of percentage of delinquency do you have here at Auburn University? Uh, in the fall was the last time that we had to report delinquency rates for the National Direct Student Loan Program, and the delinquency rate computed during the, this past fall quarter was at 6.8 percent. One thing I'd like to point out there is the fact that that is a doubling from the prior fall when we had to report on delinquency rate for that particular program. And the reason for the doubling is not that all of a sudden we have a lot of students that refuse to repay the loans, but that the formula used in determining that delinquency rate was modified so that for most institutions the delinquency rates doubled this fall. In other words, this probably had something to do with uh, all of the attention that uh, delinquency is getting from uh, across the country. Well, it particularly does when you hear some of the astronomical figures in the neighborhood of 50 percent that you hear quoted from different sources, yes. Do you think that there is a, uh, a trend by students uh, here of late to uh, become delinquent on their payments? Do you no, I really don't think that, that there's a trend toward more students choosing not to repay the loans because of the fact that they know of individuals that have refused to repay theirs and nothing has happened. I think it's an administrative type problem, both at the institutional level for some programs, at the lender level for the federal insured loan program, and of course at the federal level as well. Many of these students have either been given poor information or misleading information regarding their obligations prior to them actually accepting and receiving the loan, plus the fact that some institutions and lenders have not chosen to take a hard line in collecting the loans once they're past due. Uh, in addition to this, the federally insured loan particularly allows a commercial lender, after a point in time, making an effort to collect the loan, to turn over that loan to the federal government and receive reimbursement for that loan. And the federal government has traditionally sat on top of those and really done nothing toward making a collection effort, which they were supposed to have done. It appears now, according to things that uh, Mr. Califano has indicated, that the federal government is thinking seriously and making plans toward going with a collection agency which will nationwide look toward collecting loans which are many years overdue under these programs. How does Auburn combat the delinquency problem? How do you go about uh, making sure that the loans that you uh, are an agent for, the loans that you make, are repaid on time? Well, first of all, when a student receives an award letter from this office offering him a loan for the next academic year, it contains with it a promissory note which the student has to sign, and that is certifying that he will repay whatever amount of money he's advanced on that loan program. As well, it gives him all of the conditions under which the loan is made and all of the obligations that he has when he accepts that particular loan program. We strongly encourage students to read this material very carefully without just signing it away. We also suggest that they keep a copy of this in their permanent records so that from time to time they can go back and review it. Another thing that we're doing, and we've started this quarter, is having meetings with all loan recipients here at Auburn University. And what we're trying to accomplish here is get across to them what their rights, responsibilities, and obligations are in regard to the loan program which they're receiving funds under. We make sure that we stress very strongly to those students that are receiving loans that this is a loan. If you do not need the money, don't accept it because it sounds good now and it would come in very helpful now, but it's going to be tough later when you have to repay this money and you may wish then you hadn't taken out the loan.
Your money is being spent for that. Wouldn't it be better if we directed that money with this school program and with all of the programs? We did make it, and the honor this year of Policeman of the Year goes to Detective Ralph Tucker. Ralph. got to orient ourselves a little bit more toward than it is to wait and house them in the penitentiary late because this the neglect that's going on the abuse that's going on I thought I think that we've got to orient ourselves a little bit this the neglect that's going on the abuse that's going on I guarantee you those are your criminals I have never prosecuted nor sentenced anybody Anybody, period, paragraph, new page, anybody for a felony under 25 years old that wasn't an abused or neglected child. I say that without reservation. <coughs> now, I get mamas and daddies come in there all the time and say, I've, I've done everything I know how to do. I've tried. He just won't listen. Listen, I don't buy that for a minute. If you don't want to listen to me, it's in the Bible, too. You raise them up show a child the way he should go and he won't depart from it, I believe that. I believe that not only what the Bible says, but I believe it based on the experience I've seen. I've never seen a one of them that won an abused or neglected child. And what we've got to do is seek those people out and get somewhere to provide for them and give them a little bit of love and a little bit of attention <laughs> because by the time they get to me, I owe you folks a certain responsibility. I can't love them then and try to keep loving them. I got to get them off the street. I can't let them keep going and, and breaking the law. Uh, it's a difficult, difficult job to handle. There's fear and apprehension in the Cloverdale section of this city. Most of the elderly women are now staying home. Some are even armed or have moved in with their children. All this is caused by a violent purse snatcher. He's tagged the Cloverdale Snatcher. The assailant has robbed and assaulted a number of elderly women here as they were walking home from a shopping trip. Many people in Cloverdale have changed their living habits. I feel like I want to go in and get my groceries and come straight out and have someone put them in the car for me so that I'm not pushing the grocery basket um, and unable to, you know, hold on to my purse. You have relatives who live in Cloverdale. What is their uh, feeling about the situation here? I think they feel that, um, well, none of us want to go to the grocery store in the late afternoon. If you're going to grocery shop, you go in the morning or you go somewhere else. I think a lot of people are apprehensive about shopping around the area or walking around the area. Are you apprehensive about it? Well, not really. I have two children. I think it's the older ladies that are having the problems. Have you talked with any of the victims? Yes. Tell us about it. What, what were you told? I mean, Well, I mean, I just know the story of how it happened to this one lady, my neighbor. You know, how she was um, attacked, mugged or whatever, you know, the night when she came home. And it's dangerous. I mean, it really is for them. I think the person, I don't, whoever's doing it, I think, seems to know who lives alone and everything. Could you tell us uh, what uh, effect the uh, snatchings and assaults have had on your habits here shopping and going about your daily task in Cloverdale? Very little uh, daytime effect. I have uh, been more conscious and perhaps keep my car doors locked. Uh, I would be very reluctant to come after dark in this area alone. Uh, would be very aware of parking in a lighted area and quite reluctant to come out, frankly, by myself at night. Montgomery Police Chief Charles Swindle says the snatcher has some mental problems. Montgomery, we have some people, criminals, that are either demented or just hardened criminals that do specialize in attacking old folks that can't defend themselves, especially in the purse snatching uh, uh, line of uh, criminal activity. We do have that problem in Montgomery, as, as any other city does. But uh, uh, we are taking some steps, I hope, that will resolve this in the near future. The so-called Cloverdale Snatcher has not only affected the living habits of the older women who live in the Cloverdale section, 
He has also affected the shopkeepers in this area. Many say they have lost revenue because a lot of people won't come and shop in this area anymore. Those things will not change until police catch the Cloverdale Snatcher. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News, Cloverdale. Until last night's rain, this past week has been the first chance for many Alabama farmers to begin soil preparation for this summer's crops. Cold, wet weather has been the standard so far, with fields still too wet to plow until the short, dry spell. Farm strikers and calls for crop cutbacks aside, tractors could be seen in many Alabama fields as the short weather break allowed disking if the tractors moved quickly. The Crop and Livestock Reporting Service and Auburn Extension Service report a few fields of soybeans were able to be harvested during the past week and a half. Small grains reportedly made slow growth and are listed in fair to poor condition. Irish potato planting is now underway in the Escambia Baldwin County area. Livestock is termed in fair condition. Stockmen continue to feed hay in large amounts, but supplies are reported getting short on most farms. Soybean farmers continue to be plagued by cyst nematode which the State Department of Agriculture says is now widespread throughout major soybean growing areas of the state. Extremely high nematode populations have reduced yields in individual fields by as much as 75 percent. Farmers who suspect cis nematode problems should have their soil tested. Dick Bird, WSFA TV News, reporting. If he can get on it. Great play. Before you get to... But before you get too friendly with that goat, we want to ask you a very serious question. What we want to know is, whatever happened to you and Joe Fine? I mean, you guys used to be just like Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bird. Except in your case, we couldn't tell which one was the dummy. <laughs> but we want to give you this as sort of a token that you can take with you to remind me of you of really who is the dummy. <laughs> and I want to make one thing clear. Contrary to the rumor that's going around, Jerry is not going to receive an honorary doctorate from Auburn University. <laughs> Jerry, at this time, I take great pleasure in presenting you with the first Gold Hill Award. <laughs> it's good to see UW Clement here tonight. UW is characterized, of course, by his love of speed and automobile. <laughs> it used to be R.P. Clemens. They used to call him Richard Petty Clemens when he was young. <laughs> But they tell me now that the UW stands for unmitigated whiplash. <laughs> and it's good to see Fred Jones. Of all the people I want to see, I want to see Fred. He's the only man I know who is best described as a general foul up. <laughs> I understand that now he's asking for an investigation of the Alabama Salvation Army. <laughs> If, if he has not given a tambourine on a corner in the mall at Christmas. <laughs> and my old friend Dick Owens is here. It's a delight to see him. I always remember whenever Dick got appointed to be chairman of the Finance Taxation Committee, he went out and bought him a Robert's Rules of Order book, and he immediately threw it away. <laughs> and he told me that all his life down there in Bayman that he'd been used to dealing with hardware stuff. He was used to dealing with Nuts and bolts and screws. And he found himself right at home and he got to the legislature. <laughs> he said he was always surrounded by nuts who would bolt on bills <laughs> and screw up everything and everybody inside. <laughs> and I just want to let you see the kind of award that each of these men is, is going to get. It's something that they can display on their desk. And, in their home and in their car seats <laughs> with great play. And the first man I'd like to call for to sit on our little goat stool here, if he can.
can get on it. recipient of the 1978 Gold Hill Award is Governor Jerry Beasley. <laughs> Except in your case, we couldn't tell which one was the dummy. <laughs> but we want to give you this as sort of a token that you can take with you to remind me of you of really who is the dummy. <laughs> and I want to make one thing clear. Contrary to the rumor that's going around, Jerry is not going to receive an honorary doctorate from Auburn University. <laughs> Jerry, at this time, I take great pleasure in presenting you with the first Gold Hill Award. 